So welcome. Um, I'm here at Dharma College, which is based in the heart of downtown Berkeley. Um, we're situated um, walking distance to... Um, we are in a beautiful historical landmark building um, that is uh, over 30,000 square feet, three floors, a beautiful traditional temple. And then we have two floors, one floor that's dedicated to co-working with wisdom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then we have the top floor where I'm seated, seated um, which is dedicated to Dharma College classes. And because of COVID, um, many of our students are online and um, they're taking classes virtually. And as I mentioned, Linda, we have so many students from around the world who are um, getting connected to us through Zoom. So we're really super excited about connecting um, via Zoom and meeting new students and sharing with them about what we do here at Dharma College. And we tend to have an open house at least twice a year. Uh, in you know, pre-COVID, this place would be you know filled with some older students, alumni meeting um, new students, and just kind of opening it up to the local bay. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, we're having a concert outside, so we may have some people coming in from that. But if not, um, you know, we can just share with you virtually what we're doing here. Um, basically, I am the executive director and I came into this role a few years ago. I took over from Robin Caton, who um, really set the foundation for Dharma College um, close to 10 years ago. So we established ourselves in 2010. And some of the, um, Richard Dixie can kind of share with us maybe some of the early days of how this um, kind of opened up to, to the Bay Area. But we are um, one of 17 other organizations connected to um, the Tibetan Nyingma Meditation Center. And as it happens, my father um, started and founded Dharma College among uh, the other organizations. And Dharma College is unique in that it, we are trying to bring um, forward these ancient wisdom teachings uh, into a modern um, and more secular space. And I'm just going to um, share with you a brochure that I'm happy to send you in a follow-up. But um, just to share with you what our mission is, our mission is to translate ancient wisdom into everyday life and using whatever circumstances we encounter as an opportunity for growth, we begin to manifest the extraordinary potential of being. And these uncertain times provide the perfect conditions to discover what is holding us back from an ever available freedom. As we come to understand mind and self more deeply, we can open awareness, engage more closely with experience and find a rich source for inner development. The mission governs all of our work here at the college at both a place for learning and a community of those who share similar interests. Dharma College is creating a vibrant environment, a place for work and serious inner and outer study. And finally, um, we are bringing this mission uh, to you through our virtual program. And we really wish that we can work together to make um, our journey, uh, that we walk together in this journey through our classes. So um, these classes are very interactive. It's first of all, not an academic college, so you won't be getting a degree even though we have um, you know, college associated with Dharma. And perhaps in the future, we will come to understand why that name was given as Dharma College. But as of now, um, we've interpreted college to mean community. Um, it's a, we hope to build a community of people interested and invested in our human condition. 
And so many of these classes that we offer have a root in, in the traditional, uh, you know, the, that we do have our roots and they come from a Buddhist tradition. And of course, as I mentioned, our founder is Venerable Tartan Tuku, who was really one of the first traditionally trained Tibetan Buddhist masters who came here to the United States in the 60s. And so this is not a typical American college, nor is it a traditional Dharma center. But we are really at the crossroads of Eastern spirituality and Western intellectual pursuits. And so our program blends aspects of psychology, philosophy, spirituality, and science, but with a focus on practical applications in our everyday life. And so um, we have a number of classes that really bring us into that space of um, everyday living. And today um, we'll be introducing some of those general introductory courses um, to name four for this term, which starts actually this Friday. Um, we have meditation in six minutes a day. And uh, Dr. Richard Dixie, who's also my partner, will be talking about that. And that's a general course. Then we have Beyond Mindfulness, Embodying Freedom in Space. And we have um, Dr. Ron Purser, who will also be speaking about that. Um, I'll be teaching a class called The Art of Letting Go. And that's also for a general class. Uh, and then we have a, a class for those who are starting up a business called Mastering Successful Work. Um, so I thought um, just, just in terms of like, how do we start our journey? Because one of the things that I um, wanted to understand in my own journey is where do we start? in terms of understanding something that is beyond words and language into teachings that are perhaps uh, non-dualistic or um, um, free of, free of um, concepts. But um, so it was very important for me to kind of begin to, to um, describe how the journey would begin. And over a series of many months and many conversations, we've been talking about various ways to describe the process of this journey here at Dharma College that we invite all into. Um, and it is a complete path. So we believe in everyday wellness. Everyday wellness is bringing um, balance into our life through maybe attention to looking at certain current conditions like the COVID. We have, um, couple doctors, uh, Dr. Richard Kingston can talk about this COVID class that we're actually, I forgot to mention, promoting inner resilience and well-being. That's another uh, class that's uh, open to all. Uh, you may have concerns about what's going on with this Delta variant. And so they're very up to date on current research. Um, but not only that, we can look to them as, as medical professionals and practitioners but they've been practicing in the Dharma for more than 30 years. And so they come with a tremendous wealth of practice in everyday life. Um, so Everyday Wellness is a program that we have um, you know, introduced uh, for people. And then we'll also be doing um, a, a challenge on um, a 28 day challenge of bringing food and nutrition and um, diet and attention to food, all of aspects of just everyday living into wellness. Then we have mindful working, which has to do with our professional lives. And in fact, we've created a co-working space that is entitled the Right Livelihood Center. And this is one of the eightfold paths, basically about how do we bring balance into our work life, into our professional life. And most of us work. So eight to 10 hours of the day, at a minimum, we're focused on work. So very much in our community, we've used work as our spiritual practice. And some extraordinary um, projects have come about through really volunteers who may not know a skill, 
but they've dived in through their assets of concentration and energy and awareness to build incredible monuments and produce millions of texts. And you think, how was it possible? Well, I mean, work is their spiritual practice. And so we can really speak about um, this in our everyday lives. We have more than 50 years of experience doing that and many books to talk about that too. And so we have a whole program about mindful working and have in fact invested in a whole uh, floor uh, for startup professionals who want to find balance in their work life. So it's really the opposite of uh, burnout. Um, and if we can be a thought leader here in trying to bring more balance into our life through using work as our spiritual practice. Then we have grounded living, which um, really brings about, um, because in these uncertain times, people have often said, I would like to feel more grounded. And so we have many books and teachers who will speak about um, bringing, um, you know, those, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna admit someone here, uh, here, uh, bringing those aspects of, uh, of finding ways to get more grounded in your, in your life. And so we have classes on that. And then we have the clear understanding because um, this is a very big part of the program here at Dharma College is to see clearly and to understand our mind and self. And so the principal book that came out in the early years was Revelations of Mind and took many, many years to basically, um, you know, write and, and edit. And in fact, um, now there's a commentary, Searcher Reaches Land's Limit, and one of our senior instructors, uh, Richard Dixie, will be speaking about that and the importance of really understanding our minds well. Um, and so, um, sorry, somebody else is uh, trying to come on here. I'm just going to, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm dealing with a new, um, oh good, Timothy is on here too, great, perfect. Um, so we're just talking about how do we start our journey at Dublin College. So welcome, Timothy. Um, then finally, we have active wisdom. It's really about embodiment. You know, all of these teachings, how do we embody them in our, in our, in our being so that we can really manifest it through body, speech, and mind. Uh, and this is one of our more recent um, uh, efforts with Rinpoche's latest books called The Lotus Trilogy. Lotus body, Lotus mind, and Lotus language, body, speech, and mind. And it's, it's set up in a, a dialogue format with three characters. And um, Dr. Abby Blum, who's not here with us today, unfortunately, she's one of our, our key teachers here. And uh, Richard Kingsland, um, Dr. Richard Kingsland will be talking about that a little bit as well. Um, it is for people who are a little bit more seasoned in our classes with, with different materials, but Abby is willing to, um, you know, if there's an, a serious interest in the Lotus body class, um, she's willing to speak to you. And especially if you've had um, some background in some of the books like um, Revelations of Mind, Dimensions of Mind, or Keys of Knowledge. Um, so really to start our journey, and it is a complete path. So here is the face of our building. Um, like I said, we're in the heart of downtown Berkeley, very close to UC Berkeley, and feel so fortunate that we can be here uh, present um, to have the word Dharma and um, to explore what does that mean? Because um, so much of my background up to now has been in the East. And when you travel to these countries and you see the Buddha Dharma, you see temples and you see hundreds of years of culture that settled into communities and really now traditions. And here in the West, in the heart of Berkeley, we are, have an experiment in a way. Um, that's open-ended and invites you to engage with us. That's very important is that engagement that we're open to dialogue and conversation. And so part of the um, 
part of our journey is also going to include uh, conversations with neuroscientists and philosophers to create a museum of perception. And we'll be talking a little bit later about that because that's something first of its kind and very interesting because for me as a director, I'm very keen on getting directly into experience. So that's how we know through our own experience, what is it that uh, has been talked about for centuries and um, revered in temples as, as the Buddha Dharma. And now that it's come here to the West where we have over a hundred years of, of um, roots, um, the experiment is here in the West and will take on that um, you know, manifestation. So I leave that, that's just a general introduction and I'd like to turn it over to Richard and then to invite my colleagues, Ron and uh, Richard, um, second Richard, uh, to talk a little bit about your classes and then we're open to questions if any of you have any questions about classes that might be interesting. Thank you again for joining and I'm going to stop um, sharing so we can see each other and I will send this brochure out, which um, we've just uh, finished uh, recently. Um, so I'm happy to share that with you too. Thank you again. Richard? I'm gonna unmute, there we are. I just wanna get my screen into a gallery view so I can see who's here. Okay, so, um, you know, we've got, we've, got, we've got some people listening. I know a lot of, we actually had about 12 signups a lot of people use our Zoom classes to, to listen to recordings, unfortunately. So we find this quite a lot. But anyway, welcome, Linda. You are definitely a new face. And hi, Tim, another, another old friend. Um, our problems lie not so much with our experiences, but with our reactions to them. Now, this is a kind of well-known fact, even though our culture spends its entire life trying to change people's experiences. The question is, how do you deal with how you react to experience? And of course, in the West, we have the techniques of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis to help us understand how we react. And in the East, there's been in the last 20 years or so a great interest in mindfulness meditation to help us learn how to react to our experiences. As one was said, I think Dharma College really lies on an interface here because what most Western scientists don't realize is that the medieval traditions from which Buddhism springs had incredibly sophisticated models of mental processing. And those are not very well known in the West, but what they do is they lie behind the techniques of mindfulness, which are now becoming well known. And what we do in Dharma College is very much work with those old insights, those ancient insights, in combination with modern understandings to develop a theory of perception and then examine that theory in our own perception. Because really, if we're going to learn how to control our reactions to experience, we need to know how those reactions operate. It's all very well to say to someone, be mindful. But the truth is, if they don't have a good understanding of how their minds actually work, it's pretty difficult to go deep. And so one of the things that we very much stress in Dharma College is this interface. And indeed, the book Revelations of Mind, which actually began the college back in 2012, is an examination of perception in its first half completely. In its second half, it's an exploration of perception based on that examination. And so this is very much at the forefront of what we do. So my job, um, I'm, I mainly teach revelations of mind, um, but I also have an introductory class on mindfulness meditation. And again, there are a lot of misconceptions about meditation, I think, which have sprung up because people have the metaphor that meditation is a microscope through which you can see reality. The problem is we don't see reality. What we see is a construct we make based on our sensory inputs of reality. So mindfulness as it's normally understood is actually really quite misleading. And people land up looking at themselves essentially, 
without really understanding how that construct is made. And that's very problematic. And one of the things, again, that's come out in the last 20 years or so is the idea that you have to meditate for really very long periods, days preferably, to somehow get somewhere. And this, again, is an enormous misunderstanding of our circumstance. We're not going to get anywhere else than here. This is it. What we need to do is understand this here. This is what we really should be doing. So I run an introductory course, which is a preparation for revelations of mind, um, which is called meditation in six minutes a day. And the idea is to develop very, very short and very focused meditation practice, which simply introduces into experience very specific insights, which we can then build on in an understanding of perception and mind. So I start off developing what's called shamatha, and shamatha is essentially learning how to calm reactivity. Now, a problem we have at the moment, of course, is that we react to everything. Indeed, there's very strong reasons to think that much of our mental apparatus has evolved through the millennia to react to everything. So not surprisingly, we're very jumpy. And learning how to calm that reactivity down is a prerequisite to going any further. Otherwise, all we see is reaction, which is no good either. So first thing to do is to calm down, that shamata. Then having calmed down, we can start generating insight into key elements of how events manifest in our experience. And that's called vipassana. And vipassana is literally clear seeing, vipassana, based upon shamatha. And that's literally what it is. Um, so I teach that course as a really a prerequisite, as a prelude to revelations of mind, which then goes a lot deeper into how perception is constructed, how we can work with that construct, and ultimately how we can generate choices based on that insight. And that's essentially what Revelations does. And indeed, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Ron Purser, who is going to teach Revelations of Mind this coming year in January. And I'm going to run my meditation course up to January as a prelude for that next section. And in fact, I'm finishing off a year of Revelations of Mind at the moment this autumn alongside that course. So that's what I do at Dharma College. And, you know, just to amplify what Wamo said, we live in a very interesting time because scientific insight, both physiological, psychological, cognitive psychology, and of course, in terms of quantum physics and all the other hard sciences, are really coming to a kind of congruence with earlier worldviews in a very, very interesting way. And it opens the door for us as Westerners to both engage with our culture, which essentially is a technological culture, but we can at the same time engage with really very deep wisdom traditions, which have insights into the nature of mind that date back thousands of years. And it's that exercise that Dharma College is involved in. And we think it's a very interesting moment because barely a day goes by without me reading something in Google or whatever that confirms our position. For example, today, BBC ran this big thing. Oh, emotions are constructed. Oh, you know, wow, what a discovery. Well, it's about 2000 years out of date. That was well known back in the Pramana tradition. Um, we construct our emotions from sensations. So a sensation might be annoying. It might make you happy. It might make you sad. It might make you all kinds of things. The reaction we have is a construct. But how is it constructed? How do we learn how that is happening to us? If we could understand that, we would have control. And then we would be able to move deeper in our experience rather than always putting out fires because things are happening before we get on the scene. And that, again, just highlights back the whole emphasis we really have at Dharma College, which is that wisdom and study go together. You can't just meditate and that's it. And you can't just study and that's it. We need to combine them together. And if we can, we can start making real progress in terms of personal transformation. And really, we, you know, we do touch on bits of psychotherapy. We touch on bits of neurology and bits of physiology. And then we also have bits of Buddhism and bits of other religious thought all coming together in a view of man. And that's really what we do. 
So I think with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to either hand back to Wamu or hand over to Ron as she wishes, since she's the boss. I'll hand back to Wamu because she's the maitre d' here and we'll see where we go. Thank you. Um, Richard, I think uh, it's, it, you know, the six minute class is, I think, going to be really special for someone who's um, interested in exploring um, a practice that in our very busy day lives, um, we can begin to really go into focus and concentration. And um, I just, uh, you know, so that's some a class that maybe you'd be interested in, Linda. Um, and hi to Timothy. He's a he's an alumni, uh, one of our senior alumni, and and maybe we'll you'll have a chance at the end to to speak, Timothy, because we'd love to hear about your experience being a student here at Dharma College. Thank you so much for coming, Timothy. I'm going to hand over to Ron uh, Ron Purser, who's going to be teaching for the first time, and we're so excited because he's done a lot of. Um, Work in, in mindfulness and also in TSK. Um, he's a professor already um, in, at, uh, at a university in San Francisco. Um, and he's going to be teaching on beyond mindfulness, uh, embodying freedom and space and time. And so I'm going to have Ron um, speak about that. And it starts, um, it starts on September 8th. Um, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 to 11.30. And so um, good to hear about his class. And we're super excited to have Ron on board as uh, joining us as our new faculty. Um, but he has years and years of experience in teaching. Uh, in fact, he was just granted an award for his teaching. So we're just thrilled to have you here, Ron. Um, take it away, Ron. We'd love to hear what your class is gonna be about. Okay, thank you, Wangmo. Um, thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, uh, well, this class, uh, it has an interesting title, uh, but uh, underneath the title is actually uh, something a, a little bit different. Um, the class is going to be kind of a synthesis of uh, the time-space knowledge teachings of Tarthang Tuku. And uh, just a little background on that is that... Uh, before uh, Tarthang Tuku stopped teaching publicly, he was working uh, on a uh, manuscript that uh, was 3,000 pages in length. And through uh, the editor at the time, Steve Tainer, they worked really hard on it back and forth. And it came out into a book called Time, Space, and Knowledge, A New Vision of Reality, which came out in 1977. And shortly at that period of time, uh, Tarthang Tuku stopped uh, teaching classes publicly. And rumor has it that uh, from one of his uh, early students, uh, we heard this at the Rotten Ling retreat, that the rumor was uh, you either go traditional Tibetan Buddhism or you do time, space, and knowledge. You know, you have to take your pick. Uh, that may sound awfully extreme, but. Uh, I always, I always, uh, you know, I, I know just the amount of amazing accomplishments that Tarthang Tuku has achieved in his lifetime, uh, and he's not a person to waste time. So I always ask myself, why did he put so much time and energy into this particular teaching? It wasn't just because he had a lot of time on his hand and he just wanted to kind of play around, I think it was very, very important. And um, uh, I first uh, encountered it, well, I encountered it earlier, but it wasn't until I moved to California. I was a junior at Sonoma State University. I had transferred from Southern Illinois University. And uh, I had the book when I was in Illinois, but I... Uh, I really couldn't make any sense of it. So I discovered that Nyingma Institute was in Berkeley. So I started uh, taking classes there and then signed up for the 10-month program in time, space, and knowledge uh, in 1982. So that was I was 26 years old at the time, about 39 years ago. And it made such a deep impression on me and completely 
uh, reoriented my whole life and uh, continued to stay with it through various teachers that uh, were teaching in that program. Uh, now, since that first book, Time, Space, and Knowledge, there were five other books that he published in the series. That's why I'm saying that this very important vision, there was Love of Knowledge, this uh, the second book, I think in 1989, then uh, Knowledge of Time and Space, then Dynamics of Time and Space, and Visions of Knowledge, and then Sacred Dimensions of Time and Space. So that's uh, is that six or seven books, right? And I would argue that a lot of the recent books are sort of refractions of of time, space, and knowledge in different forms. That you can really see a lot of the themes uh, expressed in a different way. So I'm really honored to do this, and um, it's a six-week. It's two two parts broken it up into uh, two six-week segments. And uh, let me just say a little bit about some some notions about this is that I think one of the key themes is uh, that awareness doesn't necessarily have to rely on a subject knowing object orientation. That, but that's sort of the lens that or focal setting that we've become accustomed to. So. What's unique about this vision is that, like Richard said, it's not just meditation. Although in the Time Space Knowledge book, the very first book, there are 35 uh, exercises, which are, are meant to be practiced, but in conjunction with a very rigorous and challenging set of philosophical investigations that are interwoven with these practices and um, uh, I'm under the impression that one or the other won't cut it they have to be integrated and uh, so this is a way of training the mind uh, to operate in a new way especially because we're so accustomed to uh, heading towards a goal of some kind uh, because we, we normally see knowledge as some, somehow information or somehow a possession that we have to get. We have to acquire it. And because we see knowledge in that, that way, we can never, the mind can never really settle down because it's always trying to grasp at something it thinks it's lacking. So, and part of the nature of that is because that way of knowing is is operating on the surface level of time in a sense that time is moving and unfolding from the past what well, seems like it's unfolding uh, with a momentum and so we're always kind of looking for something or about something and the moment is always moving on so we can never really develop fully the we can never really, we can never really embody fully the knowledge that's possibly there or available so we're kind of always have this kind of restlessness that's constantly going on. So the time space knowledge vision, uh, one aspect is to is to call into question that whole structure, that whole uh, temporal structure, this uh, our spatial uh, sense of space, and this kind of model of knowing that we've embodied and we enact it, and. Uh, What's also interesting is that whatever appears is part of the vision in the sense that whatever's manifesting is nothing we need to reject. Uh, that appearance, everyday reality is knowledge and can be part of the vision. It's nothing, and we don't have to assent to anything either, like something seemingly higher or some, some, some sort of goal in, that's uh, in the distant future. So a lot of these practices and the philosophical inquiry are about how do we open up our perspective? How do we open up space, time, and knowledge directly? And by doing that, our narrow, our narrow perspectives kind of drop away naturally. So it's really kind of a, 
a penetrative investigation into these three facets of human experience. So with space, you know, we have boundaries, we have partitioning. We think there's uh, all these kind of separate categories, mind and body, thoughts, emotions, feelings. We have, you know, separation between our body and the world, the subject-object realms, they seem separate. All of these sorts of uh, taken-for-granted notions of, of reality, with quotes, are going to be challenged through through this, this these set of teachings. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be uh, uh, on the Zoom. There'll be um, we'll be doing some exercises, and then some people well, not some we'll be doing some exercises, but uh, other exercises people will be doing for homework in between sessions because we don't we don't really have enough time to cover the whole. Uh, book in such a short amount of time because remember I said I took a 10 month program and this is a uh, two, two six week programs but it's a really nice kind of introduction uh, in the first six weeks will cover uh, space and then the second part two will cover uh, time and knowledge so um, yeah I think that's a good overview for now I'll turn it back to Wangmo thank you Ron um, that's wonderful I'm looking forward to hearing about that and, and uh, you know, wonderful thing about Zoom is that we can tune in wherever, you know, around the world. And so hopefully, you know, by this recording, we can share what, um, you know, what took place today with those people who couldn't join us uh, so that they can hear about your class. Um, I want to turn it over to um, our dear friend, dear Dr. Richard Kingsland, he's a doctor, a medical doctor, um, and he's going to also be teaching a class on promoting inner resilience and well-being during COVID. And um, this has been a really popular class for people who are concerned about our current, you know, environment with the Delta variant and want to know more about from a medical perspective. And um, it's just very interactive. People come and ask all kinds of questions. Um, and it's just been really fun to be part of, part of their Friday day class. And that's gonna continue. It started a year ago and it's been quite popular. And they also offered it to people in India. And that was really popular because people just, you know, with lockdown, um, having a chance to speak to a doctor about what's going on in their uh, in those local conditions. So um, that will be uh, available for anyone who wants to join in by Zoom, um, including their friends in India. And so, um, Richard, can you tell us a little bit about um, the the class that you're going to be offering? And that starts September 24th, so in a few weeks from now. And it will be every Friday from 5.30 to 6.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did this last year, as Wong Wong was mentioning. <clears throat> um, and it's with Dr. Bob Dozer and I. And uh, Bob is a family practice doctor uh, in Santa Rosa, basically. But he's also been the primary um, physician for most of the uh, Nyingma community in, in, at Rodna Lang and at Odeon and for Rinpoche himself and so forth. So. Um, each one of us has been a very long-term student of, of Dartung Toku, me since 1970, and um, I think he was since 72 or something like that, but I mean, very similar times. And um, so when COVID broke, Wangmo suggested that we do a, a kind of a weekly update on, on whatever, because so many people are so worried so early on, and there was a lot of kind of confusing information. And so we tried to make sense of it from our each of our own points of view, from Bob's and, and my point of view. And then also we sometimes had another uh, uh, primary care physician, uh, uh, I forget his name, Mastin or something. But anyway, then Wang Mo introduced us to the Indian because it was a huge Indian problem uh, last uh, January, February, March, and it exploded in India. and we were lucky enough to be able to talk with some of the people that were connected with multiple NGOs there. And, and we suggested different things that could be done. And they eventually put together an entire package of uh, medications and supplements uh, that anybody could get for just a few dollars. And 
And uh, fortunately, their huge run up was a very quick run down too. So they're doing quite well in India now in terms of COVID. So now there's the Delta variant and it's likely more transmissible, probably not more lethal. Um, case fatality rate is lower with it than with the original alpha variant, but everybody's very concerned about it because it does tend to transmit, transmit more frequently. It's, it's more infectious. And, uh, and then there's now the sort of question of, well, how effective are the vaccines ultimately going to be in the very highly vaccinated places like Israel, Malta, Gibraltar, Iceland? They're beginning to lose effectiveness five months in or something. And so that changes the picture all over again. So we're gonna be discussing each of these things that comes up and, and trying to get some kind of a handle on how best to you know, move forward. We're eventually gonna to have to live with it sort of um, and how best to do that and what other models are there of other countries in the world and what they're doing. So anyway, COVID is, is a significant part of it because there's an awful lot of interest naturally. The other part of it is about, well, what can you do other than vaccination that could potentially support your immune system. And there are certain things you, you know, vitamin D and zinc and um, melatonin and curcumin and a number of things can, can be beneficial. We don't know how beneficial, but uh, they can certainly help. And certainly being active and adequate sleep patterns, those are all important too. You just, uh, you have to keep moving if you want to keep living. So, um, so those things will be discussed also, COVID updates plus sort of wellness and supplement ideas and thoughts. And then uh, there will also be a sort of introduction to some uh, Kumye, which is sort of a Tibetan yoga uh, and also just basic meditation practice. So it's an introduction to three different things really. COVID updates, uh, wellness, and then sort of introduction to basic meditation practices that can help in wellness. So that's what that class will be about. And then do you want me to also mention about the Lotus Body class that is actually run by uh, Dr. Abby Bloom, but also with Dr. Bob Dozer and I, and, and Jonathan Cluley too, I think it's gonna be uh, all three of us as sort of a, associate teachers or TAs or whatever. And so uh, this upcoming class is called Lotus Body Part Three. So I don't know, you'll have to talk with Abby if, if you have a strong interest or some previous background. Otherwise, it's kind of the last third of the first book in the Lotus Trilogy series. That's Lotus Body, Lotus Language, and Lotus Mind. And they go in that order generally. So it's taken us a year to do the Lotus Body section and we're two thirds, three quarters of the way through. And so this next part is the one last one third of, or, or last quarter to one third of the Lotus Body book. But the Lotus Trilogy itself, as Ron was saying, it's, it's kind of a different take a little bit, but it has basis in time, space, and knowledge, I'm sure. And, um, but it's a very interesting setup in that it's designed as a dialogue between three different um, characters. And it's introduced in such a way that it's almost like platonic dialogues in that every single position is sort of questioned and in some ways kind of undermined until you're seeing that there's no final position, that every possible stance can be opened into a wider view. And it begins with seeing how the body relates to space or space relates to the body, and then how language frames perception or perception also influences language, of course, but how the structure of language is oriented towards a subject object orientation, which is really problematic in some ways, because there might be a much broader sense of experience that does not quite include subject opposing or capturing object. And then Lotus Mind is sort of the synthesis of how that works in a, in a wide open space. And so it is related to the earlier time, space, and knowledge, but it's a different presentation of it. And uh, so it's going to be sort of a two or three year probably a two year process to go through all three books, which I've just recently done, which is why I'm now sort of a junior faculty member here. So uh, that's what that's about, but I'm not sure who it's open to exactly. It's mostly open to the continuing people that are finishing the, the, this last six month uh, process on Lotus Body, but it may be open to others, depending on what uh, Abby, who's the primary teacher, uh, decides in discussion with whoever's interested. So those are the two main things I'm working with at Dharma College uh, this time. 
Thank you so much, Richard. Um, really welcome anyone to that class promoting inner resilience and well being during COVID. Really um, would encourage anyone who's got questions about COVID or fears. I found it really helpful, Richard, just to hear um, professional medical advice and, and also to have part of the class um, attend to, to meditation exercises that allowed the mind to sort of calm calm down or, or um, uh, give some reflection on how we can have more deep caring in our lives. Um, so the, that uh, there's just a couple other classes that I'd like to mention for just general uh, attendees. Um, the last, um, the, the exciting new class also is with um, Terry Beckman, um, who comes with years of experience in developing entrepreneurial um, strategies. And um, she's actually based in North Carolina and works uh, with a boutique firm uh, in helping startup organizations. And she's coming on um, in our mindful working series to be um, offering this, a very special offering for those who are starting up organizations um, um, based on a book called Mastering Successful Work. Um, and you can find out more about it after this class because I'll be sending a link out to the timing and more information on her. And then finally, I'll be teaching a class called um, The Art of Letting Go. And basically, we'll be looking at two books, Gesture of Balance here and Open His Mind. Gesture of Balance is one of the earlier books that Rim Che um, gave us. And uh, really, I like to bring the class into our own personal experience of maybe um, events or difficulties that we've had um, that we want to let go of, or maybe experiences that are still hanging on in our own lives that we may find an opportunity now to free them. <laughs> and so we will be using these two beautiful books, Gesture of Balance and um, Openness Mind as our sort of daily meditation and reflecting on how we can let go. And is there an art to that? Is there a bit of grace in letting go? And the freedom that lies when we let go. There's a tremendous sense of freedom when we um, are able to let go of possibly things that may prevent us from being fully. Um, this extraordinary potential of being that we talk about that um, we like all of us to be in the flow with. Um, so we need to get to those places that maybe are not so consciously aware of, but hold us back from really being. And then we um, find ways to let go um, of those um, interruptions in our own being. So that's um, our classes for, for this term. Um, we are, um, uh, every term is six weeks long uh, and we have five terms in a year. Um, and so you've heard four classes that are really open to the general public. And we start our classes this, uh, uh, this Friday with Abby, um, Abby's class. And um, as Richard mentioned, if there's people who are listening to this that are especially interested in Lotus Body, um, please reach out to myself or to Abby um, about getting in her class. And now I'd like to just turn it over, if you don't mind, Timothy, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot, if you don't mind, because you're one of our senior alumni. Uh, and we do have uh, a program for alumni, and we're very excited to share that that's something that Timothy is also getting involved in. And it's the first time that we're doing this for our alumni. 